This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And hello, welcome to Jerusalem. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, it's so cool. We got to go to Jesus's tomb yesterday. And I, as I was in there, the only thing I could think is, wow, because this tomb is empty, because Jesus rose, we now have life. So thank you so much for joining us. We love you. This is the last uh, Sunday in our journey here in Israel. There's a lot of ambient sounds going on. You can hear the prayers from the Muslim mosque, which are just above us. We're here at the southern wall of the Temple Mount, where the original Jewish temple was. Of course, now it's the Alaska Mosque. And then down below us, we have a road with children playing and buses driving. The rain has been coming and going all day. We'll just deal with that. And we invite you to join us today in Jerusalem as we worship together with you wherever you are. Join us today as we have an hour of power coming to you both from Jerusalem and from Irvine. Of course, many of you are in Irvine right now watching live. Maybe you're at home watching wherever you are. We're so, so glad you're with us. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much that your Holy Spirit is with us and we come before you boldly in Jesus' name. We ask that you'd help us to completely understand what it was you wanted us to learn. Help us to be like Christ and to live like him in everything we do. We love you, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. God loves, God loves you and so do I. I recently released new music and the song that I want to sing for you next is a song that I actually recorded, wrote and recorded with my brothers in Fiking Country. And it's really a song about revival. And a great revivalist said, if you want to see revival, go into your room, close the door, draw a circle on the ground and step into that circle and say, Lord, let revival begin in this circle. Let it start with me. And so the song just says, Lord, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Let revival start with us. And so um, there's an awakening that I, I believe is, is happening and beginning here in the U.S. and, and, and long, being longed for around the world. And it can start with us. And so let's sing the song. It's called Kingdom Come. I pray it's a blessing to you. Your hands are healing, your heart 
Give it up for the orchestra. Great job. Thank you so much. A joy to be with you. In preparation for the message, Matthew 21, 4 through 11. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna! Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Amen. Lost to save find their way at the sound of your great name all condemned feel no shame at the sound of your great name every fear has no Your great name, the enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name, Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us, Son of God and
All right, Ronnie, we are here in Jerusalem. What is that sound that we're hearing above us? Right now is uh, noon time. This is the main prayer time. And the Muazin call for the prayer. And after the prayer, there is a preacher who is teaching the surah of today, the chapter of today, and that's the background. Got it, okay. And where are we here? What is this? This is the southern wall of the Temple Mount. Tell us about it. This is the southern retaining wall. This is one of the four walls that Herod built in order to achieve a plateau on that eventually. And the, the main entrance to the temple used to be right over here. I mean, uh, we can see there are three arches over here. And uh, we're standing on the elevated area. Use, most of the pilgrims came from the south. And the reason why <clears throat> the main entrance is going to be right over here is because from any other direction, you're coming down to the temple. For Mount of Olives, you're coming down. For Mount Zion, you're coming down. And in Jewish way of thinking, you don't, go, you don't just go down to the house of God. You, you always go up to the house of God. And the only way to get to the house of God by climbing up is to be from the city of David. So that's why the main entrance is going to be over here. And of course, those steps which are leading into the temple, which are going to be very interesting. I mean, these are not regular steps. They are uneven. It's not one, the same step. Uh, two very small steps and then we have a very large step. And then we have again a small step and a large step. The idea is that people will not run to the temple. Uh, they are going to watch the step, they're going to look down. And by looking down, they're sort of bowing and they're entering the temple area. Awesome. For people who don't know about the significance of the temple in Judaism, this is the second temple. There was a temple before that. Um, what were those, what was the difference between the two and what happened to those two temples? First of all, the first temple was built by King Solomon. Even though David was really in a huge wish or willing to build the first temple, he couldn't. He was a warrior and King Solomon II, he was anointed down there by the Gihon. Uh, the first job, that or first mission was to build a temple. Uh, it took him quite time and then a beautiful temple stood up here on top of Mount Moriah. And this, this is what the Jewish people are going to call the first temple. This temple is going to be destroyed in the year 586 by Babylon. After two years of siege around Jerusalem, the temple was destroyed and the Jews were taken to exile for 70 years. They come back after 70 years with a, with a permission from Cyrus to build the temple. And because they were 70 years in exile, their budget was minimal. They had almost no money and they built a little tiny temple so they can have a center for the Jewish people. And this temple was here most likely until the year 30 BC when Herod, uh, the King Herod, that we like to call him Herod the Great, um, approached the Jews with an offer to build them a, a new temple, which the Jews said, we don't think it's a good idea because A, we don't like you, <laughs> B, uh, you're not a real Jew, and see, we don't trust you. Yeah. And Herod says, don't worry, uh, I'll do whatever you want. Uh, of course, if you want me to take 1,500 priests as you request, I'll uh, train them, and then we'll build the temple. And that's exactly what happened. He was very specific about the planning. He built the biggest temple in the world, 35 acres of land and a beautiful temple that was standing in the middle of the Moriah Hill. And this is the entrance that we saw. And this, this originally would have been more like a, like a slope, right? And he Absolutely. dug out, made it like this 90 degree angle and built this retaining wall. And some of these are the same exact like Herodian Roman era stones. Absolutely. We're touching this floor. This is, this was. All original. These are the Herodian stand. All the lower level that you see along the wall is Herodian. And those stones uh, look very naive, but some of them are going to be up to 600 tones. So where we're standing, this is where the money lenders were, and this is where Jesus turned over the tables. He would sit over there on the steps and preach. We're actually in the actual spot where Jesus was standing and teaching. Absolutely. This is the most important place, I think, in Jerusalem when it comes to what Jesus was teaching and preaching. Um, we know, we think that we know, that Jesus lived uh, on the slope of Mount of Olives at the house of Lazarus, and every morning he walked down and he was sitting and teaching. In the Jewish way of thinking, the rabbi is always sitting and the students always standing. He wouldn't stand here where people are entering the temple holding the little animal that they want to sacrifice. This was too much for the people because, you know, when you come once in your lifetime to Jerusalem and you hold the little goat, you really don't want to talk to anybody. You really want to get to the temple, pray, sacrifice, walk around, and then when you relax, you're walking out of the exit and over there, there's a rabbi sitting. And there are always people around him, always people around him, at least 12 disciples. And of course, uh, people have the sense of, secure, of, of curiosity. 
they're walking around and say, wow, what is going on? Let's hear. And like that, Jesus always is going to have the audience around him. And if we think about the southern steps, this is most likely where one of the miracles that he performed, one of two that he performs in Jerusalem, is going to take place right over there. That's the, the uh, healing of the Pool of Siloam. Right. Gospel of John. So, so in jo John chapter 9, the blind man comes and Jesus uh, puts mud on his eyes and tells him to wash in Siloam, which is the mikvah where you would prepare to come to the temple. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Finally, um, tell me about the money changers. <laughs> why was it, why was Jesus so upset about the money lenders? You know, he's a, the prince of peace. He tells us to love our enemies. And here you see this uncharacteristic judgment from Jesus that, that is in a way holy and necessary. What was the deal with that? Well, um, people are coming from all over the world. You know, we are pilgrims coming from Damascus, we are pilgrims coming from uh, Egypt, you know, from all over. And uh, most of them they are going to carry the local money which they have at home, which is, which is going to have an image, a coin with an image. Mm -hmm. uh, the book of Deuteronomy is very clearly, it's very clearly saying that you shouldn't have any image and any, and any um, sculpture and you shouldn't bow. The, the coin with an image into the temple. Like a coin that has uh, the picture of Caesar on it. Absolutely, mainly. God. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's why, and that's why the, the people had to change the money into the half silver shekel, or which is a, or a silver shekel. And the money changers that were sitting over here, they were sort of uh, what we're going to call them in today's language, sort of crooks. Mm -hmm. You know, there are many places to change money in the city of Jerusalem, but the one who forgot or they were in a rush, they couldn't enter the temple with the foreign currency, so the last minute change point is going to be right over here. And that's what they did. They took advantage of they being absolutely by themselves over here, and they overcharged the people in a way that was unknown, unbelievable. On top of that, it was a holy place. They shouldn't sit here. This is not a place for money changers. Yeah, and didn't you say also that everybody wanted to do it, but Jesus was just kind of the first one to actually... Absolutely. I mean, they were so hated by the pilgrims. They were so hated by the people of Jerusalem, but nobody had the, the strength and the power to approach them and tell them, come on, get out of here. This is not the right place. But on that very same Wednesday, when Jesus is going to come, and uh, turn the tables over and kicks the chairs and push them out of here, on that very same second, the whole city of Jerusalem was in a wild situation. Because many people in the Galilee knew Jesus because he was known. I mean, we know about thousands of people which are appearing and come and listen to his teaching and preaching. But the people who came from other countries, they never heard about Jesus. But on that evening, everybody in Jerusalem spoke about the rabbi from the Galilee that had the strength and the power to come and do the unbelievable and clear the temple for those money changers. And that kind of sealed his fate for crucifixion. Well, as many people say that uh, the second that Jesus uh, turned the tables over, the, the pilgrims were very happy. But the Jewish authorities and the, and, the, and the Roman authorities, they realized there's a troublemaker here. I mean, he can start an uprising like that. Everybody was so overwhelmed about his behavior and they decided to eliminate him. They wouldn't do it here because there's so many people around here and it's, it's, it's not, it, it's not going to work. They were waiting for the right opportunity, which is going to be one day later, when Jesus is going to leave the upper room and he's going to walk to the Garden of Gethsemane, and over there he's going to be captured. Many scholars believe the second that he turned the tables over, most likely he signed on his death certificate. Amazing. Thank you, Ronnie. We Pleasure. appreciate you, so, you so much. much. Thank you. Bye. So why do we sing? Why do we smile? Why do we gather? The reason is there's joy here. There's love here. Let's celebrate that this morning. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet.
from that grave My God still rolling stones away There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet Thank you for being part of our Hour of Power family. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. Every day we receive viewer comments, prayer requests, and testimonials from viewers all around the world. Some with heartfelt prayers for my family and for the staff here, and some with testimonies about how they've been touched by the Holy Spirit. A recent testimonial talked about how her connection with God was strengthened by spending time in prayer after the sudden death of her father. Psalm 54, 2 says, Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. To be still and sit with the Lord in silence and solitude can be so gratifying and moving. It gives us a chance to really hear from our God and seek out what He is calling us to do, or not to do, for that matter. Yeah, the Lord beckons us to lean into His presence, open our hearts before Him, and be transformed by the renewing of our minds. As we seek Him first in our lives, His love naturally and effortlessly pours out within us and in turn through us to others. If you give God a little time every day, you'll be surprised at how your spiritual health will shine brightly. Take a look at the special offer we have to help you get started. Call, write, or go online to request God's Minute One, 365 Daily Affirmations for Positive Prayer. This mini devotional combined from the prayer life of our founder, Dr. Robert H. Schuler, is perfect for your pocket or purse. We're asking for your gift of $20 or more. For your gift of $50 or more, you'll not only receive God's Minute 1, but we'll also include God's Minute 3 and God's Minute 4, which also contain inspiring and uplifting prayers from Dr. Schuler. Give one or two as a gift to a loved one, or keep all three. Let God's Minute series empower you to consistently choose faith over fear. 
Call, write, or go online to request God's Minute One for your gift of $20 or more, or for your gift of $50 or more, we'll also include God's Minute Three and Four. All it takes is a minute of your time each day to connect with God, and you'll be on your way to an enriching relationship with Him. Hannah and I are truly grateful for you, and we're praying that you'll be consistently changed by the amazing grace of our Lord, so you can reflect His glory to everyone you encounter. Thank you, and remember as always, God loves you, and so do we.
Wow, this is an amazing time. Good morning, everybody. It's such a joy again to be with you here this Sunday morning coming to you from Jerusalem. We are here at the southern steps of the Temple Mount. So in Jerusalem, of course, a fifth of the city is made up by just this one platform right here where the temple and the court of the Gentiles and Solomon's portion, all of those famous things, it all happened right here. And so today, my sermon, I want to talk a little bit about um, Jesus turning over the tables of the money changers. Just to the left of me here is the entrance to the temple, the main place where people would have entered. To my right is what's today called the City of David. It's the smaller, original city of Jerusalem that King David uh, sort of established as the capital of Israel, of Judah. And down at the bottom, actually they recently discovered it, it's the original pool of Siloam that functioned as a mikvah. So if you were a Jew and you came here to Jerusalem during Passover, you would go to that mikvah, you would wash yourself, and then you would take this long ascension of stairs, you would sing the ascension psalms, and you would prepare your heart and your mind to go into the temple, and then this would be this amazing place where you're like, wow, I'm about to enter into God's house and into God's company and God's court. And uh, this is also, though, the place where the money changers were. And everybody wanted to see the money changers uh, knocked out. Before we get to that, the temple is a symbol of God's love and grace for us. You know, God wants to be with you. Throughout all of the Old and the New Testament, you constantly see God desperately wanting to be with his people. And sometimes his people are, are with God and other times they sin and they fall away. Maybe even this morning or this evening, wherever you're watching, you can feel that way sometimes. You're like, God does not want to be with me. God is ashamed of me or God you know, doesn't want to spend time with me. But the temple is God desperately wanting to be with his people. So the temple in Jesus' day was called the house. I don't think they ever call it the temple. Maybe they do, but they call it God's house. And I love that image that it's the place where you gather to be with God, God your Father. It's interesting, we see actually the first connection to the temple at the very beginning of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates the Garden of Eden in seven days. There's seven speeches that God gives. And then uh, later on, when the temple and the tabernacle are established, God also, the, the temple priests give seven speeches over seven days as they establish both the tabernacle and the temple. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve are called to work and to keep the garden on God's behalf, later on the priests are also called to work and keep the temple. And then you also see that the um, the, the design of the temple, the inside of the temple, is full of gold and rich flowers and all sorts of imagery that is a reflection of what the Garden of Eden would have been like. So we think of the Garden of Eden as the way the world should be, as Adam and Eve walking and talking and being with God, and in a way where they're naked, right? Then the idea of being naked is like totally vulnerable and with God. So in the same way, uh, uh, the temple becomes like a little garden that's supposed to be where in a world of, of chaos and sin and people harming each other, you can sort of get away from it and be with God and be made right with God. And the temple is also where you can make a sacrifice to make an atonement for your sin so that if you've really hurt someone or really made a mistake, you can have a, you can be reconnected with God. So the temple again, it's just a symbol that God is so gracious, so loving, and he wants to be with you today. Maybe you're not religious, you're not a Christian at all, you're at home watching on television, you're like, but that's not how God is. In fact, God hates it when people do things like that. In fact, the Jews believe in the Ten Commandments. Some say that the worst of the Ten Commandments is taking God's name in vain, and that's exactly what that is. When people pretend to be from God, but they hurt you, they're actually driving people away from God. So God, you don't need anyone except Jesus Christ to connect with God. He made the way where you can spend time with God today. Okay, so this is the Temple Mount. And this is where Jesus comes on the triumphal entry. 
Jesus rides on the donkey into Jerusalem. He goes through the Golden Gate, and then he comes here. This is called the Holda Gate. This is where Jesus said, hold my beer. I'm going to kick over these t- tables, and I'm going to set things right. We'll get to that, but this is, a, this is a setup because the money changers were the thing between people and God in many ways. So Jesus' story of the uh, riding the donkey is actually a hyperlink to another famous Jewish story of when Solomon becomes king. When you read 1 Kings, you see this dramatic story of King David, the one who you know, creates this nation. He unites the 12 tribes of Israel. He makes Jerusalem the capital. And now he's old, he's 70, which in the ancient days is like extremely old. He's on his deathbed. And he has 19 sons. And usually in those days, it would be the oldest of the 19 sons. The three eldest have probably died. And so now the oldest living son is a son named Adonai. The Bible says Adonai is really good looking. You get the sense that he might be pretty charismatic. I heard one guy say, but he also might have been a little bit dumb. We don't really know. But he was like the popular guy and he's the oldest. So according to custom, if nobody is named, Adonai should be the one who becomes king. But uh, early on, David had said, I don't want Adonai to be king. I want Solomon to be king. And so when David's on his deathbed, just over here in the city of David, uh, Adonai uh, decides, I'm going to try and take the throne and not allow Solomon to become king. So he gathers all of his brothers except for Solomon. And he gets just one priest. And he gets some of the officials and he makes a sacrifice, a big grand sacrifice, and throws this party. And they start shouting, Adonai, long live the king Adonai, even though David is still alive. And the prophet Nathan and Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, go to King David and they say, my Lord, have you not heard? Didn't you say that King Solomon would be, uh, would be the king after you? And he says, as surely as I live, Solomon will be the king. And so he said, take my mule, my donkey, and put Solomon on him and take him down here to the Cadron Valley where the Gihon Spring is. There anoint him to be king and then have him ascend Zion, ascend this hill, and there put him on the throne. And so they do exactly that. Uh, Bathsheba and the priest, the prophet Nathan, go down and they anoint Solomon as king and he's on King David's uh, mule, which is like our version of Air Force One. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but the king's mule is a huge symbol and it's a way of saying this is the king's pick. And as Solomon comes up the hill, there's a whole parade of people that are with him saying, long live King Solomon, long live King Solomon. And he sits on David's throne and King David praises the Lord that the one he chose, Solomon, became king. And then like kind of a funny story. At the same time, well, Adonai, the guy that tried to take the throne, they're celebrating. They've all had a few glasses of wine. They'd have a huge feast. They're laughing it up, having a great time. They think the story's over. And a guy named Jonathan comes into the party and he says, my Lord Adonai, have you not heard? King Solomon was placed on David's mule and was anointed king at the spring and now sits on his throne. And it says that all the officials and all the people who were with Adonai quietly dispersed. So they went from shouting, long live King Adonai to quietly dispersing. Like we weren't really there, you know? And Adonai freaks out and he runs up to the temple and he grabs the horn because there's this thing in the law that says, if somebody accidentally murders someone, and they grab the horns, they're safe until they take their hands off the horns. So Solomon comes up and he talks to Adonai and he says, I won't kill you, I won't harm you as long as you do what's right. And Solomon becomes king. So oftentimes when we see Jesus ascending this hill from the Mount of Olives over there through the Cadron Valley, through the Golden Gate on, on Palm Sunday, we think of the prophecy from Zechariah, and we should, but another hyperlink is this other story, not just the messianic part of Jesus, but the kingship of Jesus, that he is called to be the Prince of Peace and the King of our lives. And so with a king comes authority, authority to set things right in your life and in my life. And so when Jesus 
a, comes down through this valley on, on, his, uh, on his donkey, and he goes into the Golden Gate. He comes down here probably from behind, and these money lenders, uh, he kicks over their table and he drives them out. Now, what was the big deal with the money lenders? You know, during Passover, so many Jews would come from all over to come here to celebrate this you know, great holiday. But you're only allowed to take kosher money into, uh, into the temple. So like if you pull out a dollar bill uh, from your, your pocket, you'll see that on there there's all sorts of images of animals or of people. Well, in Judaism, you're not allowed to do that. So you have to exchange whatever currency you have for shekels that don't have any, you know, pagan imagery on it or anything. And that's fine, right? It's okay to exchange money. But what was happening is the money changers were taking, you know, giving you a huge haircut and making a huge profit, uh, profit from that. And so all these people who have this big heart and they just want to be with God and they want to celebrate with these people and they want to sing the songs and they want to make sacrifices, they come here and if they forget to, you know, get the right money, they get this massive haircut when they exchange. And Jesus comes and, and uh, uh, of course, our guide, he said earlier that everybody wanted to do this, but then finally this famous rabbi Jesus comes and he actually does, you know, what everybody else wanted to do. He comes in, he kicks over these tables, and he sets things right. And so you see that uh, when he does that, he says, my father's house, so again, there's that word, that is the, the word they use for the temple. He said, my father's house shall, shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. He chases everyone out. Nobody stops him, of course, because everybody knows that, you know, this thing was wrong. And, and in a king-like way, he sets free the temple from these robbers. And then instantly, he just begins to heal people. There's just this outpouring of the Spirit, and people are coming to him, and there's this amazing Passover miracle where Jesus heals people. And I just have to say, even just standing here, it's in a way just overwhelming seeing some of these stones here. These are all the same stones where those money changers would have been, where Jesus would have walked through, where millions of Jews every year would have come and made sacrifice. This is the place. And, and these are the doors, even though they're blocked. This is the place people would have come to be with God. But you know, you don't need a temple anymore to be with God. The temple was a beautiful thing and a place in Jerusalem that people would go to, but Christ has made the way in our lives that Peter tells us we have become living stones, that the Holy Spirit dwells in you and me. We think all the time about how amazing it would have been to go into the Holy of Holies and, and to go into that place, but you know, you're a Holy of Holies now. The Holy Spirit dwells within you. The power to heal, the power to forgive, and to, and to speak God's word, and to do great things for God, it's inside of you. And so often we have religious experts who say, oh no, God can't use you. Or we have religious frauds like these people who take money or harm you, and God can't use you. And I just wanna tell you, God just wants to be with you directly. He just wants to spend time with you, and he wants to be be with you now. So make Christ king in that same way that sometimes like Adonai, you know, tried to take the throne. Maybe other things have tried to take the throne in your life. Make Jesus the throne in your life. You'll never regret it. And then also remember that sometimes when we invite Jesus into our life as a king, there may be some things in our heart that he has to set right. I imagine that cleansing the temple as he did probably you know, it looked in a way a little bit violent. It probably was a mess. Things were spilling everywhere. Probably money was lost and property was broken. And I think this is sort of what happens in life sometimes when we go through a transformation. Sometimes maybe you've recently come to faith or you can sense that God is doing something great in your life. Sometimes when that happens, things get messier before they get cleaner. You start digging up old memories, old sins, mistakes that you made. You start to feel a lot of shame. Maybe you're experiencing a lot of stress as you're going through transformation. But I want you to just trust those things to the Lord and believe that sometimes things get messier in God's kingdom before they get cleaner. 
You know, it, the, the way that God fixes the house isn't always decent and in order, as we like to say. It's, sometimes it's a bit of a mess. More than anything, the temple is a symbol that God loves you, that God wants to be with you, that he wants to spend time with you, and that somehow people just, I don't know why, people sometimes just want to get in the way of that, or people want to capitalize on that. Don't let that happen. And don't worry about it. Just go to God directly. And if he does some things in your life and maybe speaks to your heart about some things that'll be hard to deal with, just trust him with it. And watch how that often will precede healing. You know, all of us need healing in some way. A lot of us have been broken and wounded. A lot of us need physical healing. And so often in the Bible, there's, um, you know, there's words about forgiveness and restoration that have, have to happen before the healing. Sometimes we forgive others or re receive forgiveness from God, but that happens um, before we receive um, healing from God. And so I wanted to invite Hannah actually to close out this sermon and to pray for you. You know, I could pray for you as well, but we do ministry together and Hannah has, I think, just real, a real anointing for prayer. So I want to invite Hannah to come and pray with me as we finish this message and pray that God would uh, help you and bring healing to your life. Hannah, would you come? Thank you, Bobby. Um, the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I am a living testimony that God still does miracles today like he did in the Bible times. I, w I had 15, 14 years of stomach issues and autoimmune things that the Lord completely healed me of. We had people we prayed for who had cancer shrink and didn't need chemo anymore. People that we've prayed for who um, joy returned to their life who had who were originally on different types of antidepressants. So I, as I pray for you right now, I want you to release your faith and listen to the words that I'm praying. These are for you. God wants to heal you actually in this moment right now. So would you join me in prayer? Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So healing is part of your ministry today just as it was when you healed those in this temple. Thank you, Lord, you promised us healing. You went to the whipping post for our healing. We know you came to give us life and life to the full. Only Satan wants us sick and tormented. You use the word sozo for salvation, which means full physical, mental, and spiritual healing. So our physical and mental healing are part of our salvation. So we take you at your word right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, heal the one listening right now. Thank you that because you have just heard us, we now have what we have asked. Thank you that the one who has heard this prayer is now healed. I ask the healed one would act their faith after this prayer and do what they could not do before in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your healing salvation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. And watcher, would you act your faith right now? If you need healing, do what you could not do before. We thank you that the Lord is truly a miracle worker today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you all so much for joining us on this three-week tour in Israel. I hope this was as meaningful for you as it was for us and our team. And I hope that you get a, a closer picture of what it would have been like to be with Jesus in the Holy Land. And it gives you a clear picture of the Bible. And of course, it's appropriate that we finish here in the Holy City of Jerusalem. Thank you all. We love you so much. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for watching Hour of Power on YouTube. We hope this message encourages you. Like and subscribe below for more encouraging content.